again for this uh, blessed time together. We thank you that the worship prepares our hearts for the message. That when we worship, when we sing our praises to you, when we hear other beautiful voices just leading us into your throne room, we want to know you more. And we know that that is done through your word. And so we thank you this morning that we can enter into your word and uh, we can just be blessed by knowing you better this Easter morning uh, by the truth revealed in your word. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, it's awesome this morning, you know, to have so many young people joining us up on the worship. They sing so well. And it's interesting to watch children of all ages grow in their understanding, their relationship with God. I heard about this um, Sunday school teacher listened to two of her preschoolers talking about God and Jesus. And the little girl said, I really love God. And the little boy said, I really love God too. And I love Jesus. And the little girl said, yeah, me too, but it's kind of sad that Jesus died. The little boy said, I know, but it's okay. He comes back from the dead every Easter. <laughs> well, not exactly. <laughs> But he did come back from the dead, and that's, uh, that's what we're celebrating here this morning. And um, in chapter 3 of the book of Acts, we see the power of the resurrected Jesus when Peter and John heal a lame man by saying to him, in the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, walk. And the people who witness this miracle are amazed, but Peter says to them, men of Israel, why are you so amazed at this? Why do you gaze at us as if by our own power or piety we had made him walk? And then Peter begins to teach them about the power of faith in Jesus. He says, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus, the one whom you delivered and disowned in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, but put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. And on the basis of faith in his name, it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man whom you see and know. And the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. Now keep in mind that what's amazing about everything that Peter's saying is that it wasn't really that long before this, before he's proclaiming this, that Peter, John, James, all the disciples were hiding from people. They weren't standing on the street corners proclaiming anything. They were hiding. We see in John 20 verse 19. So it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, which would be Sunday, when the doors were shut and the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, peace be with you. So obviously the question is why were the doors shut? Why were they hiding in fear? They were hiding in fear because up to this point they actually thought that their teacher, their leader, the guy who they had, had believed was the Messiah was dead. And they had seen the Jewish authorities hand him over to the Roman authorities. They had seen the Roman authorities then crucify him, call him a troublemaker, an insurrectionist, claiming to be the king of the Jews. Uh, these disciples had seen the whole thing. Now they ran away, but they were watching. They saw the arrest, they saw the trial, they saw the sentencing, they saw the beating, they saw the crucifixion, they saw the burial. So make no mistake about it, the disciples had every reason to be fearful. Because if the authorities had done these horrible things to their leader, then maybe they would be killed next. That's the reason why Peter ended up denying three times he ever knew Jesus. I don't want you to do to me what you're about to do to him. So then how is it 
that Peter and John, just a short time later, are praying for healing for a lame man in the name of Jesus. Because let me say, tell you something. You don't ask for somebody to be healed in the name of someone who's dead. Because dead people don't have any power. So the significant difference between the disciples in hiding and Peter and John proclaiming healing in Jesus' name is found in what Peter says in verse 15 there when he says, the one, Jesus is the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. Because everything changed when Jesus appeared to these fearful disciples when they were hiding behind closed windows and locked doors. Because the resurrection is like a game changer. It doesn't really matter how the disciples felt before the resurrection. It doesn't really matter that they were fearful. It doesn't matter that they were hiding. It doesn't matter that they had lost all hope. The only thing that mattered was that Jesus came back. And that understanding is the setting for what we're going to see in Acts chapter 4 as we look at this today. We're going to show you a little video clip here involving Peter and John as well. Priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, elders, and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and the other men of the high priest family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power? Or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you, and all the people of Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. So keep in mind that this group of guys that Peter and John are now standing in front of are the exact same group of guys that sentenced Jesus to death. The Sanhedrin, the, the ruling elders, these are the same guys that had the power to turn Jesus over and Peter and, and John should be shaking in their boots. But they're not. They had just spent the night in jail over this. But they're bold. They don't care. Because it's actually the chief priests and the Sadducees at this point who are worried. The Sadducees are really worried because the Sadducees, as opposed to the Pharisees, had a particular teaching which is that there is no resurrection. That nobody comes back from the dead. Not now, not after a little while, not on Judgment Day, not ever. And that's why when verse 2 it says they were greatly disturbed because Peter and John were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. And it wasn't just a matter that these were two babbling fishermen talking about something foolish. These men were claiming they had seen Jesus alive again. And they were very convincing in saying so, because verse 4 says, many who had heard the message believed, and the number of men came to be about 5,000. If you can get 5,000 people to believe what you're saying, you must believe it first. And Peter and John believed that Jesus was alive because they had seen him. And so this response puts the Sadducees into a panic mode. 
So they locked the disciples up, the two of them overnight, and then they put them on trial the next day. And they, this is the accusation or the question they bring to them. By what power or in what name have you done this? In other words, we know that this man used to be lame. We know that now he can walk. In fact, he's running and jumping and leaping all over the place. The issue is, are you claiming that there's some sort of magical power that healed this man and that that power comes from your faith in somebody who is dead? Well, Peter starts off in his answer with an extremely bold statement. In verse 10, he says, Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified. So, in other words, what he's saying to them is, I understand why you think he's dead. You killed him. But then the next thing he says is even bolder. Whom God raised from the dead. Peter's saying, how you like them apples, Sadducees? See, he's saying, you can say all you want. You can teach the people there's no such thing as the resurrection. But now we have proof that you're wrong. We have seen Jesus resurrected. This is how John expressed it himself in 1 John 1.1. 1, 1. He says, what was from the beginning? What we have heard, what we have seen with our own eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. It's interesting because John says it's not, this, it's not just that we heard about the resurrection. They heard about it first because Mary Magdalene and some others had seen the empty tomb. They heard about it. But he says we've seen it. Oh, and by the way, we didn't just see it. We touched him. We touched him with our own hands, he says. And then Peter kind of rubs it in a little bit to the Sanhedrin by quoting Psalm 118.22 to them. He says, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. But he actually changes the wording. He says, the stone which you builders have rejected. You builders. Because the chief cornerstone of the new covenant is Jesus and who rejected him, the Sanhedrin. So he says the, the stone that God was going to put in place as the foundation, when Jesus, when we celebrate communion, we, we read the words that he said when he said, took the cup and said, this is the cup of the new covenant, brand new covenant, changed everything. He was the cornerstone of a new thing, but the Pharisees, the builders, rejected him. And actually, this isn't the first time that that verse had been used to point out to those leaders that they were blowing it by rejecting Jesus. Jesus himself quoted this same verse to them in Matthew 21, 42. He was telling the parable of the vineyard and the wicked owners of the vineyard who got thrown out. It says this, Jesus said to them, did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? This has become the chief cornerstone stone. This came about from the Lord and it is marvelous in our eyes. See, that's really the bottom line about the resurrection. It was the thing that changed our lives. The Lord did it. It's marvelous. I just want to read you a little quote from a, a French Christian writer who, who said this because it's so powerful the way he put it. He says, belief in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ is the belief on which every other Christian belief rests. It is how we know that this first century rabbi, Jesus, was not just a teacher, but actually the son of God. He rose from the dead. Indeed, the only way to explain the sudden and baffling growth of early Christianity despite Jewish and Roman opposition was that Jesus of Nazareth really did rise from the dead. There was no notion of bodily resurrection from the dead in Jewish or Greek or Roman religions. 
And in fact, at the time of first century Judaism, when Jesus came as the Messiah, there were actually a lot of other people who claimed to be the Messiah. But they never, ever claimed that somebody who'd been killed was the Messiah. In fact, in Judaism, it was believed that the Messiah couldn't fail, which he didn't. But to them, dying kind of seemed like failure. And everything about that culture made it extremely hard for people to believe that a crucified man could have been the Messiah. The best and maybe the only explanation for the fact that a bunch of first century Jewish men suddenly, inexplicably, started running around claiming that the crucified prophet was the Messiah and had risen from the dead is that they saw him. Yes, we believe that it actually happened, that it literally happened. And as Christians, we believe that Jesus' triumph over death wasn't just his triumph, it was our triumph too. Because we believe that the death and resurrection of Jesus changed the world, not just in a historical level, which it clearly did, but also at a supernatural level. By being willing to go to the cross and then rising from the dead, Jesus, who is the Son of God, saw how tweaked the entire spiritual universe so that sin and death were destroyed. Sin and death have been revealed to be things that can be overcome. And so we explode with joy on Easter because we believe that through Christ's resurrection, we can be resurrected too. Because Jesus Christ defeated death, we will have eternal life with God. And if the crucifixion was about everything bad in the world, then the resurrection is about how we can be free from everything bad. For Christians, Easter commemorates the fact that supernaturally, the resurrection of Jesus Christ changed something so fundamental about the world and about humanity that will never be the same again. Christians, for Christians, Easter doesn't say death is a tragedy that might eventually be compensated for. Easter says death is a, merely a transition to an eternal destiny. And in the end, the meaning of Easter is as simple as this. Life triumphs over death. Hey, I'm going to close with a medley of songs here, you might say, wait a minute, what season is it, Pastor Steve? Because you're going to recognize the tunes are Christmas tunes, but the, the lyrics are Easter lyrics. So we had to change them a little bit here. So you can sing along because you know the tune. Hark the herald angels said, why seek Jesus with the dead? He's not here, as you can see. Grave cloths lie where he would be. On your way now, tell the others, Jesus will be with his brothers. Sisters too, he wants to see. On the hills of Galilee, hark the herald angels said, is risen from the dead. Sing it with me now. Hark the herald angel said, why seek Jesus with the dead? He's not here as you can see. Grave cloths lie where he would be. On your way now, tell the others, Jesus will be with his brothers, sisters too, he wants to see on the hills of Galilee. Hark the herald angels said, he is risen from the dead. Thank you.
Hallelujah. In excelsis Deo, glory to God in the highest. Father, we thank you. We give you glory, not just at the birth of our Savior, Lord, but at the resurrection of our Savior. We understand that he came to die, but he came to defeat death so that we would never have to worry about death. Yes, we will pass through what Psalm 23 calls the valley of the shadow of death when we leave this earthly life, but we go immediately to an eternal life that's been prepared for us by Jesus, by the power of what he did for us, by his sinless life and his perfect sacrifice and the power of resurrection in him and now in us. We thank you, praise you, and give you all glory in Jesus' name. Amen.